Um, so typically when I've done these kind of presentations, I've talked about like a specific software implementation, um, like my HESIM package or some micro simulation models I built today. I thought I'd do something a little different, which is talk kind of more generally about some of the lessons I've learned and, and what I think are some good software practices when you're developing your own models. Uh, initially, I was gonna talk about micro simulation, but I realized everything I wanted to talk about was decision modeling more generally. So hence the slightly more general title. Um, just to, to give a little background. So I think as, as everyone knows, decision models can be quite complex. Um, they often have pretty large numbers of parameters. There can be complex relationships between inputs and outputs. And because of that, as well as other reasons, sometimes models may not be transparent, efficient, or flexible. Um, and especially the transparency angle can kind of diminish their perceived credibility. And while it has often been argued, including by me, uh, that part of this is due to the choice of software, like Excel versus R, for example, I would say that software is not actually the only culprit. Um, indeed, good code, in, in, by my estimation, is just as important, if not more so, than the choice of software for kind of achieving some of the goals we'd like to, to achieve. And given that, I think if we can follow software engineering best practices, um, there's a lot of potential to really improve the quality of our code and then uh, by extension enhance the credibility of, of what we're trying to do. So just to kind of to start with a list of what might be considered attributes of good code, certainly not exhaustive, um, also tailored a bit toward the decision modeling framework, not kind of general software. Um, here's four that I, I thought would be good to list. So one is transparency. So can we write code that's easily understood and, and is also reproducible? Second uh, is reliability. Um, that is, we want to make models that produce the output that we're hoping for, and we have as few bugs as possible. And then there's efficiency. So here I consider two types of efficiency. So one is that we can actually program the model in a reasonably fast way, given our intended purpose. So if it takes us you know, three years to program a model, that, that's not so great. Um, but secondly, can it actually run fast enough for what we want? So those are um, often competing, but they, I think they both play into efficiency. And then extensibility. So you know, sometimes we might want to adapt our model to a new disease area, add new treatments, um, lots of things. Can we, can we do that easily? And what I'm going to do today then is try to talk about some ways that we can write code to try to achieve some of those goals. Um, and to do so, I'm going to walk through just kind of a little simple example um, that will maybe help set the scene. So to start, we'll have just a little decision problem where we have five competing treatment strategies. Um, for now, I'll say we have 10 representative patients, say they, they vary by their age and sex, and we'll do kind of the simple or standard cost effectiveness analysis for our decision framework. And then to do the modeling, so um, we'll just do a simple Markov cohort model. We'll say that we do care about uncertainty. So we'll, we'll do a probabilistic sensitivity analysis. It's a bit of a toy example. So we'll just have three health states, uh, say a sick, sicker, and death state. Um, keep it simple, yearly model cycles, short 20 year time horizon. And on the bottom, which will really be the focus is, of the talk is building the transition probabilities. Um, I just have a, a, a table that kind of shows how they're built for each of the possible transitions. Um, one note too, I, I think one thing I often see is programming that's uh, separate from the actual mathematical structure. So I think if we could kind of come make it very clear like how the programming is implemented to achieve the math, I think that can also help transparency, just a little side note. Um, but in the table I have C is, I'm just calling out the complement. So that's one minus the sum of all the other uh, probabilities in a, a given row. And the way the model, the framework or this model will be set up is, uh, the transitions from the sixth state will be a multinomial logistic regression. And that's what we have in the transitions to the sicker and death state. So what that means is the treatment effects for treatment strategies are, are log odds ratios. Um, and I'm also gonna have some covariate C, which will be age and sex that will affect the transition probabilities. And then from the sicker state, we'll just have a single, a single rate parameter that will determine the probability of death. So it's kind of like a, an exponential survival model, if you will. And then so given that background, um, I think one thing that I've, I've really learned is that you should plan ahead when you're building a model. 
So often you kind of just want to jump into the coding or kind of start actually doing things. But if you think about what you actually want to achieve, I think you can do things in a, a more efficient manner, ultimately, and in a cleaner manner. So for example, we might want to think about the output that we need, or we want to answer with our decision problem. In our example, two things we'll definitely need are our state probability. So the probability of being in each of the three states at a given model cycle. Um, and since we're in a cost-effectiveness framework, we'll also want to compute costs and qualities um, as we see in the table on the right. So if we think about that output that we want, we could also think about the steps or functions that we actually need to produce it um, along the way. So what would we need in, a, in a, this kind of modeling scenario? We might start by saying, okay, so let's define our treatment strategies, define our patients. Remember we have five strategies, um, 10 patients, representative patients. Uh, we'll then need to sample the parameters if we wanna do a probabilistic sensitivity analysis. Given that input data and parameters, we can think about simulating our state probabilities in a, a Markov framework, also simulating costs and qualities, and then finally performing a, a CEA, perhaps in a, a PSA framework. Uh, we might also then think about, okay, so given that's what we want to do more generally, can we put that into some kind of a modeling pipeline? Um, and you can think, okay, if, if I wanted to read this, if I wanted to show it to someone to read the code that I'm doing, what might that look like? So this is kind of pseudo code, but you can try to think of something that's actually pretty human readable um, as a modeling framework. So here is trying to do what we have on the left, but in, in code language. So creating the input data, getting the parameters we want, simulating our state probabilities, um, simulating here I said expected values mainly for space constraints on the slide, but you could, you know, for example, separate into costs and qualities or something as well. Um, doing our ICER and maybe um, finding a probabilistic sensitivity analysis. And then in addition, when you're kind of playing ahead, you go from the output, you also maybe think about, okay, what are the inputs that actually need to feed into that pipeline and, and get to the outputs? And can we put those in a convenient framework? So remember we talked about, we have five treatment strategies, 10 patients, how might we store that data? Um, so one way you could think about it is like creating a single data frame, which sort of is uh, every combination of patient or strategy that can be helpful, for example, vectorizing things as well. So that's, that's what we have here. Um, it also will store like any covariate information that, that we might want. Um, and then for the PSA, uh, we got to think about how we're going to use the parameters. So here is just simulating the parameters um, from kind of a suitable probability distribution. One here is an example set from the multinomial logit model, another set for the, the rate parameter. Um, so essentially it's each coefficient in, in the model. And, and this is a particular draw from um, the probability distribution. And here you might know, well, okay, there's actually, you could think of two ways we could do the drawing of the PSA. Um, kind of like Javier's talk, you can think of a bunch of nested loops. And then within each nested loop, we're gonna sample the, per, the parameters one time for the PSA. Or you could think, okay, maybe we actually wanna pre-do, pre-sample all the parameters at once, and that could help us vectorize things. So first today, we'll, we'll start with the kind of nested loop strategy. Then I'll talk about the vectorizing later. Uh, a, a second thing is choosing a style guide um, and sticking to it. So I don't think you need to pick like a particular style guide, that's not important. It's more just sticking to something and making your code readable by having kind of the same style throughout all of your code. I personally like the, the tidyverse, but I think they have a, a nice style guide that you, know, you can use really whatever you want. And just to give an example, so here is what you might call quote unquote bad code. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for that. So you can see on the left, we have inconsistent naming conventions for the object. So sometimes we're using underscores, sometimes camel case, sometimes capitalization, sometimes lowercase. Similarly on the right, um, our functions are also named inconsistently, sometimes camel case, um, sometimes uh, underscores. And then there's some other things that we might not want to do. So for instance, for, for instance in base R, there's sometimes dots in the function. Um, which is a bit confusing because a dot can also represent what's called an S3 method in R. So if we see sim.stateprobs, that might just be a function called sim.stateprobs, or it might be a function called sim that has a specific method for an object called stateprobs. So it's a bit confusing. Um, likewise, I think it's generally better for functions to be verbs. So for example, we have expected value sim, that's maybe it's better to say sim expected values. Um, of course, there's there's idiosyncrasy. So you, you maybe don't always need a verb. Like if you have a well-known noun like ICER, you can just have a function called ICER. Like in base R, for example, you don't have compute mean, 
there's just a function called called mean. So here's maybe an example of some arguably better code. But again, the, the main point I think is to just stick to a consistent style, not the particular style that you choose. And then this is one of the most important um, is, is writing modular code. So on the left an ex is an example of the opposite where we have a loop over the samples from the PSA, a loop over all our treatment strategies and patients. And then within that loop, we're doing a whole bunch of stuff. So we're sampling the parameters, we're creating the transition probability matrices, we're simulating the Markov chain. And you can see how that can become pretty unruly, particularly if you have like lots of if else's or kind of different rules. Um, on the other hand, on the right, we have something that's more modular. So what we're doing is we have the sim state probs one function, which will simulate for a particular iteration of the nested loop, um, the state probabilities, and it just does it in three steps. So sampling the parameters, computing the transition probability matrix, simulating the Markov chain. And then the function on the bottom is just kind of like a helper outer function, which will just iterate over the samples and input data and, and compute the state probabilities. So why might we want to do modular code? Um, one, we can make the code almost like reading English language. Um, so I think it's much more transparent and you might not even need as much documentation if kind of is obvious what the different functions are doing. Uh, it's also easier to test function and, and identify sources of bugs. Um, things like unit testing. But if you know if you find an error in your code and you have a, a really long, huge function, like where is that error? Where is it coming from? Whereas if you have a bunch of modular functions, you can kind of test them independently for the single thing that they're, they're trying to do. And then finally, it's a lot easier to, to refactor when adding new features. So if you want to extend your model in any way, or you've, you've written your model like 80% and you realize something you forgot about, if the code's already modular, it's much easier to kind of put it back together to something you want than if you have really large functions. Um, so here's just a little bit of an example of the transition probability matrix. Um, so we have this function TP matrix. It produces the output on the right, which is just the transition probabilities. And it's a really short function. So literally all it is is this sub functions, transition probability from the sick state, transition probability from the sicker state. So just two sub functions. And what are those doing? So those are doing what I talked about earlier. So from the sick state, it's a multinomial logit model to get the transition probabilities. From the sicker state, um, it's the, the exponential rate type model. And what we can see is there's not that many steps that are needed. Um, and there are themselves calling other functions. So for example, from the six state, we have a general function called mlogit props. So that could be just like a general function for if you have a multinomial logit model, how can we predict probabilities? Um, so you can see that on the bottom left. They don't have the implementation here, but I, I do have it in a GitHub repo. And likewise, if we're trying to make predictions in um, like a regression framework, we need both the parameters and then we need a, a model matrix or an input matrix. So we have another function called make x which will just produce the, the model matrix we need to, to make the predictions. Um, but again, I think that the main point is just to kind of keep things modular and having each function try to do one specific thing rather than trying to do too much in a, a specific function. And then finally um, is to consider vectorizing your code. So this is something that I think the first three that I talked about um, modularizing the, the style guy of sticking to a style, um, those help with everything. So they're, they're gonna help make your code more reliable. They're gonna help make your code more transparent, more extensible. But efficiency can be a bit of a trade-off. Um, and that sometimes if you make your code more efficient, it can also make it less transparent or less, less readable. So for example, in Javier's example in the, in the previous presentation, um, there's a bit of a trade-off between kind of usability for the user and efficiency. So by giving the user the ability to write their own R functions um, that kind of work within each nested loop, it, it's it's very nice for the user. It gives them a lot of usability. I think it's very transparent, but it also comes with an efficiency loss. So you kind of have to make a trade-off and think about the problem that you're trying to, to solve and whether it's worth making it faster. Um, but so at our example, we had five treatment strategies, 10 patients, 20 model cycles, and 1,000 PSA samples. So if my math is right, that's a million iterations. Um, 
just doing the simple example looping in pure R. So all the nested loops, the, the code runs in approximately 45 seconds, which, which is actually, you know, not, not so slow, but if the problem gets larger, we have more health states, um, more model cycles, more fine model cycles that can get even slower if we need to do a lot of different model scenarios. Like say we want to do different sensitivity analyses, we might not want to wait, you know, two minutes to run 40 different scenarios. So you kind of have to think about the, the problem you're actually trying to answer and whether it's worth it to, to speed it up. Um, if we vectorize the same code, I get it down to two seconds. So go from 45 to two. So that's a pretty big speed up and the, the gains would be larger and, and bigger problems. Uh, the, the specific way that I was able to vectorize um, in the package I developed called HESIM, um, there's a, a function called TP matrix and essentially what it does is it will pre-compute your transition probabilities. So here we can see for every combination of the PSA samples, every treatment strategy, and every representative patient, we have a flattened transition probability matrix. And since they're all pre-computed, what that means um, is that we can actually simulate the, the Markov model in a vectorized manner. So HESIM has a C++ implementation of, of simulated from a Markov chain. So if you can pre-compute your transition probabilities, you can take advantage of that um, C++ functionality to, to do the simulation in a quick manner. And then just to, to add a few concluding thoughts. So again, I think R is a really great software for decision modeling, um, but that doesn't mean that we don't need to follow good software practices to, to make better models. Um, if done carefully, I think we can have very transparent modeling and, and it's definitely possible. On the other hand, I don't think there's strong incentives to make things transparent. So either in academia, industry, consulting, um, you know, we often, for example, we want to write a paper, but there's not really a need to have, you know, people when they review a paper, they don't review that the code is transparent. They just review the results of the paper. So there's not really that incentive to take the extra steps to, to really make our models um, transparent. And Kevin, just I think to say also, two minutes. Oh yeah, sure, I'm almost done. Um, there's also a lot of potential, I think, to leverage open source packages. Um, they can make what we do more efficient, also less error prone. That said, I think we should work together more to, to do that. I'm, I make, I mean, I could do better as well. So I know I'd like, for example, to take my HESIM package and allow it to work better with some of the work John Luca has done, like the BCA package, um, maybe serve HG. But I think if we could kind of combine what we do, um, that would be quite nice. And then finally, I know we're not software engineers, but if we think a little bit more like them, maybe that's not such a bad idea. I'm happy to answer any questions. Yeah. Thanks very much, Devin. I think I was, along with everyone else, looking a bit nervously at my own code um, after seeing all these good practice things. Um, I'm wondering if anyone would like to raise their hand and ask a question. And Devin, just while I have you on this dot question for coding style. So the S3 method uses a dot, but a lot of base R uses dot for its naming conventions. Do you know how that happened? I, I don't know the history. Yeah, I don't know the history. I think generally nowadays people recommend not to use dots for that same reason, but I don't know why the original writers of the R language did that. I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, so Arthur, I'll just ask you to unmute. Oh, sorry. Hi, really nice talk. You're completely right. Um, I've seen in other areas of R, you know, this is, you know, these are well-known problems with R. Uh, I, the only contribution I have here is I can tell you why people now use underscore and um, when they when they used to use dot right so, so the reason why we didn't always use underscore was because for like or version one and maybe version two underscore could actually mean equals so you could do x underscore two and that would mean x equals two which is the most awful syntax you could possibly imagine so I think I think or had these all these bizarre iterations back in the early days and they changed it. Sorry, that's, that's a very small contribution there, but I really enjoyed the talk and, and everything you say is completely true. Completely Thank you very much. James, I'll just pass to you. Sorry, thanks very much, Devin. Uh, it seems like you're giving your talk from the set of Hitchcock's The Birds there. Um, <laughs> I, I, I wanted to ask about- I actually, liter I literally am. I'm 
30 minutes from where they filmed the, the movie, oddly enough. <laughs> I thought that might be the case. Anyway, but on topic, um, on vectorization, uh, do you find a limit of vectorization that there's a certain point where it doesn't make any sense to go that you know any further and small loops are appropriate and do you have clarity on that i mean it, in a sense you kind of almost have to, i could be wrong here but in a sense you almost have to commit to whether you want to fully vectorize to whether or whether you want to just do everything in, in nested loops um because if you want to fully vectorize i mean you you kind of have to think about pre-computing stuff. Uh, also, also, I'll say that it, it differs if you're trying to make something really general than if you're trying to write like your own specific code for something. Um, Coding I mean, vectorizing is really just like writing stuff and compiled code under the hood. So you can kind of write like your whole engine, for example, very flexibly in, in C++ if you wanted to. But that, that's a lot of extra work to, to do something like that. Um, but then it can also be kind of annoying. Like sometimes I think writing stuff in loops is more readable if you just have like for every iteration of the loop, you have what you're doing. Whereas if you have something that's like highly vectorized, it can be kind of hard to read and understand exactly what's going on. Um, so it's not really a great answer to your question, but I think there's definitely trade-offs and you really need to think about how efficient you actually need your code to be. Excellent. Thanks very much, Devon. I'm really sorry, we're going to have to draw the discussion to a close because we're just over time. So Gianluca and others, um, we can maybe continue the discussion in the chat. And Devon, thank no you problem again. There.